Good morning and welcome everyone to the first keynote session of CBMP 2020. I'm Marco Bellino and it is my pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Sarah Tico. Sarah is a, the founder of VR health tech startup Hatsumi, producer at Deep and the healthcare leader in Merce UK. During this talk, Sarah will discuss the application of immersive technology in healthcare to support patients, educate clinicians, and help inject a bit of fun into the set, into the recovery process. It promises to be an exciting talk, and we're very lucky to have Sarah with us today. A quick reminder to the audience, if you have any questions, please submit them throughout the talk via Sarah's Discord channel, which can be found under the keynote section. Let's all welcome Sarah Tico with her talk, Immersive Art and Healthcare. Over to you, Sarah. Oh, lovely. Thank you for such a lovely introduction, Marco. And, um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I think Patrick, Christian and the team have done an amazing job of putting this together and it feels very exciting to be part of such an interesting and um, interdisciplinary event. Uh, so I'll just try and get my slides up on the screen. Uh, and get started. Um, so hi, my name is Sarah Tico. Um, uh, like they kindly meant, uh, you kindly mentioned Marco, I'm the founder of Hatsumi, producer of Deep and uh, healthcare lead at Immerse UK. And, uh, and really, I guess all my work is really about uh, bringing together uh, art, science and playfulness using immersive technology um, and exploring how that can support people in their, their health and, and well-being. Um, I guess I, I initially tried to be an academic and failed miserably at that and decided that I was going to sort of embark on this um, sort of new mission to think about how to how we can work in a more interdisciplinary way and sort of dissolve some of the boundaries between the arts, uh, academia uh, and the sort of industry as well. Um, but as a little bit of a background, so I um, studied anthropology at university. I did uh, social and biolog biological anthropology with um, a year in Japan. And, uh, and it was really uh, once I graduated that I first became quite fascinated by immersive art. And, uh, and it was around uh, 2012 that my father actually passed away. And I think uh, loss can just do some very bizarre things to you. And, uh, and I remember just feeling very lost and not really knowing what I wanted to do. Um, with my life, but also like as a, in, in terms of career uh, as well. And so it was then that I started to volunteer at this gallery down in Brighton, where I live, called Fabrica. Uh, and Fabrica is a really incredible contemporary arts organisation housed inside a former Re Re Regency church where they commission site-specific installations. And, uh, and so after not engaging in the arts particularly uh, through most of my life, because I just felt like it was just something that wasn't um, accessible to me. Uh, I started volunteering here in the gallery and I think that it was sort of uh, being part of this exhibition so all the volunteers contributed uh, their shirts uh, to, to this an installation and then being in the gallery and starting to have conversations with the public about what this artwork meant which was really about the experience of, of grief actually that really opened up my, my eyes to the power uh, of, of the arts as a way of starting conversations that I guess um, uh, don't always exist in, in other areas of people's lives unless they, they, they pursue it in different ways. Uh, and, and it was incredible just sort of watching all, all the children, especially like running through the gallery and playing with this and kind of feeling like they were a part of that experience um, as well. Uh, and then I guess for, fast forward a, a couple years on, I started to work in film uh, as well. So I moved to a place called Lighthouse um, in Brighton and was working in, uh, on a series of film um, projects there. And, uh, and I ended up going on holiday and it was whilst I, I was on holiday that I ended up becoming quite unwell. And so this uh, rather cringe um, holiday photo is actually uh, a photograph that was taken of me at the peak of what was later described as um, a psychotic episode, I guess. And so I was uh, traveling, traveling across Thailand actually uh, by myself and in this quite um, florid state for, for quite a few weeks, not really knowing what had happened to me. Uh, and it was once that I returned to the UK and sought help uh, that, uh, that I got diagnosed with, with this condition. Um, it was actually mania with psychotic symptoms. And I remember just sitting in this doctor's office, uh, trying to describe what had happened to me, but not really having the words to explain what had happened and kind of being terrified that, 
you know, this was like almost like a death sentence of saying like, it's not like a sickness, like, you know, having the flu or something that is just something that happens to you. I felt like there was like this radical shift in, in who I was as a person. And I remember getting my sort of form that said, you know, you have this code, this is your code for your condition. I think I really felt like, um, like a data point in that moment and it felt quite hopeless. And I think having worked in the arts, I became really, really interested in um, how, how not only I could share my story in a different way, but the fact that there are lots of people that struggle to share, share their, their stories as well. Um, and especially in a, in, a, in a doctor's sort of office as well, you're trying to take all of these experiences that have happened to you and, and, and construct it into some sort of narrative in a short period of time to get help. Um, and, um, and that was quite, quite a, a challenge for me. Um, and so I'm lucky that something like that hasn't actually happened again, but I think it really started this question for me of like, especially how technology uh, can help us sort of understand what it might be like to be somebody else and how we can talk about uh, these different layers of realities that we all experience day to day. And I've become incredibly fascinated with VR uh, for that reason um, exactly. Um, so I don't know if many of you are familiar with this project, uh, A Machine to Be Another by, by Be Another Lab, uh, which are a really incredible group. And it was, uh, I, this was one of the first projects I remember starting to explore when I first became interested in VR, of how you could explore things like embodiment and perception um, in, in some quite fascinating ways. So kind of a year on after that, uh, I ended up uh, moving to Australia for a bit, uh, doing the sort of classic uh, mid-twenties crisis where you can go and get a working holiday visa and go further uh, further abroad. And I wanted to, you know, try have some new experiences. So I moved I moved to Sydney. Uh, I ended up working uh, with Sydney Film Festival as a volunteer on their, their VR lab. And that was kind of after uh, seeing this incredible um, sort of science writer and communicator called Jordan Newen, who gave a talk at TEDx Sydney, uh, where I was initially first working when I moved there that really talked about the, the power of VR as a way of really exploring uh, our sense of self from a very different perspective. And his talk showed what it was like to meet himself in VR and all the ethical um, potential um, kind of questions that virtual reality brings up, uh, as well as how it can con con um, kind of challenge our, our ideas around sense of self uh, and how it can help people with, um, with their own mental well-being as well. And it was also during that time that I was working with the School of Life as well and kind of thinking about ideas around philosophy and psychology and developing sort of emotional intelligence, I guess, and, and became really in, interested and excited about how can we actually sort of bring all these different ideas together and make things that are playful and interesting and engaging when talking about difficult subjects as well. And so um, sort of as I started to become really fascinated with how VR could be applied in all these different ways, then uh, it was around that time that I uh, joined the Big Anxiety Festival. So the Big Anxiety Festival was an arts and mental health festival run uh, through the University of New South Wales uh, in collaboration with a series of artists, um, scientists, uh, psychologists, um, and people all around the world to kind of explore the connection between, between the arts and mental health. And so it was there that I was invited to, um, to be, become um, a, a virtual reality and mental health um, curator. And I guess through this experience as well of working with them, it really sort of opened my eyes to what the arts and health actually is. Um, and I think that it's a really kind of fascinating emerging um, uh, kind of area of inquiry that has become more and more relevant, I think, especially this year with COVID as well. And it's this very sort of multidisciplinary approach to looking at how the arts can actually truly transform healthcare and support people in, in meaningful ways. And there are a lot of really incredible outcomes from uh, engaging in the arts from, you know, helping people's health and well-being down to a biological level the fact that going to a, a concert or a live event can actually reduce biomarkers of stress um, it can improve your psychological well-being as well and create a sort of sense of control uh, over the world when sometimes we do feel like we have a, a sort of lack of autonomy and help us create new tools to be able to self-regulate as well um, I think the social elements of it being able to feel part of a community and bond as well uh, that sense of sort of like flow and community uh, so, for example, things like being part of a choir um, is incredibly impactful on 
supporting people's health and well-being uh, and then from a behavioral level as well being able to use stories to encourage people to ultimately change their behaviors in ways that, that can really help them as well um, I think if you want to read more about that, this, then there's a, an incredible researcher called Daisy Fancourt, uh, who's based at UCL, that does a lot of really kind of um, incredible um, sort of communications about this and has been re really leading on um, this sort of arts on prescription model as well of looking at how uh, it, encouraging people to engage in the arts can really support people with anxiety and depression, uh, chronic pain. And that you know a lot of of, of um, problems can be down to things like isolation as well, which I think we're all really really focusing on um, this year, or, or, or you know we're all we're all really challenged by this year as well. Um, and, and the arts and health arts and health has been a, a core part of I think the human condition since sort of the beginning of history as well. Um, I wanted to include this image of a Venus figure because I think you know right from from I guess the, the first art that has been created then it has also been exploring health um, from from different perspectives as well. Um, and and that the, there is this kind of connection between how we express our, our, our own forms of lived experience and how these belief systems can really affect uh, how we engage with the world as well. And so I guess bringing, bringing it back into the, the current day, then I became really fascinated with how can we, we bring these ideas around arts and health uh, when, when, and bringing it into ideas around uh, emerging technologies as well. So at the Big Anxiety Festival, then we showed um, a series of, of different, different uh, projects that were kind of using VR to explore a variety of these um, different concepts. So um, for example, in the top left, that was um, a, a project called Labyrinth Psychotica that was visualizing the experience of psychosis using sort of augmented reality uh, and, and, uh, and being able to create this different, this additional layer between, between the, the participant and the world. And they worked with people with lived experience of um, psychosis to, uh, to develop that experience that was incredibly moving. Uh, and on the top right as well uh, is a project called Explore Deep, uh, which I'm, I'm now the producer on. We'll talk a little bit more about later on. But this is a breath controlled experience that was uh, showing people how to self-regulate uh, their, their emotions and, and manage anxiety through slow, deep breathing. And that's how you travel through this beautiful underwater world. Uh, and then the, the um, project in the bottom left hand corner as well is a project called Q that was about a man that's living with depression um, and, and you have to sort of help him see colour in the world when he can't see it as well. And so it was really exciting sort of being able to learn as I went because I was still very, very new to, to the different applications of, of virtual reality at the time. But it was through this research and developing this ex exhibition that I became absolutely fascinated with finding out that there are so many different applications for virtual reality in healthcare. Uh, anything from physiotherapy and rehabilitation, getting to uh, motivating people to um, to sort of engage in exercise and you know uh, sort of almost gamify that experience and um, there's a really incredible researcher um, at Sheffield Hallam University called Ivan Phelan that's done some really incredible work in uh, rehabilitation with children. Uh, the applications of VR in mental health is incredibly vast as well. Uh, anything from virtual therapy, being able to do therapy remotely, to getting people to do their own uh, self-therapy as well. Uh, so, for example, Mel Slater and uh, Virtual Body Works based in Barcelona did an, uh, an incredible project uh, called Freud Me, when you start and you are standing in a room opposite Sigmund Freud in virtual reality and uh, you're invited to tell Sigmund Freud your problems and then suddenly you swap bodies and you are um, suddenly becoming Sigmund Freud and you're invited to listen to yourself and give advice back uh, and then you then swap bodies again and listen to that advice and they found some really significant um, changes in, in people's ability to sort of uh, actually action that advice and, and see that see their problems from a very different perspective um, which I thought was really interesting. And actually they tried that with, with the different characters you could like embody. So they did Michelle Obama me and Steve Jobs me. And, uh, and I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, what, how would we give advice as if we were someone else? And how can we take those learnings and actually apply it to different areas of our lives or, or, or take these learnings from virtual reality and not necessarily have it as something that we do need to do every day, but really just shift our, our perspectives about how we are perceiving ourselves and our problems. 
Um, again, with mindfulness and anxiety management, being able to go into these like relaxing uh, environments and things like deep, which again, I'll talk more about later, the fact that we can, we can sort of uh, create a shortcut to learning how to, to meditate. Um, virtual reality is also used quite extensively in palliative care as well. Um, I'm actually trained to be a death doula, so um, a no, sort of non-medical support going through uh, to people going through the end of life process. And I think being able to uh, do things like reminiscence therapy, take people back to places that perhaps they used to go to when they were younger, um, as well as uh, sort of exploring the world when, especially in care homes, then people can't go anywhere. Um, being able to bring in multiplayer social experiences as well and, and enabling people to, to meet with their families and, and feel like they're, they're with them virtually when we can't be there in person, I think is incredibly important. Um, and, and how it can be used in pain management as, as well. Um, there's a lot of research that's been done into the applications of VR in reducing pain by putting people in these really um, sort of compelling, immersive experiences. And there are a number of hospices around the UK that are already um, using this. Um, one person I would recommend looking up is someone called Dr. Sheila Popper, who's actually been working with uh, Sir David Attenborough to create um, a VR experience called Gardens of Serenity that's been a way of helping people manage their pain and actually has halved uh, the uh, the number of opioids that they're using in managing pain as well. Uh, there's also a lot of work going on in uh, surgical training as well uh, in clinical skills. So Health Education England have a huge immersive training strategy uh, going on. And with that, they're also looking at how this can support in patient education as well and being able to visualise uh, sort of what, what going to the hospital might be like and, you know, using even 360 film to visualise where you are going and what that experience may be like, as well as saying, you know, this is actually the surgery that's going to happen. We're going to take you inside the body and explain what happens here. Um, there's a, a surgeon up at Alderhey Hospital in Liverpool called uh, Rafael Guerrero, who actually has been taking 3D scans uh, of... Um, of patients, specifically of a patient's heart, it was a three month old baby, and was able to put that into unity uh, and, and sort of expand it to like 300 times the size and actually look inside him and plan how he was going to do that surgery as well. So to be able to see the, the really sort of minuscule things on a, on a on much larger scale, I think is incredibly powerful. Uh, as well as enabling people to sort of perhaps empathize with um, with other people and perhaps, you know, um, be used in things like prisons as well. I know there has been some early work in that, for example, enabling um, uh, uh, prisoners to uh, sort of see what uh, the, the, the perspective of their victims as well. Um, I'm a little bit sceptical sometimes if VR is actually the ultimate sort of empathy experience and how much you really do know what it means to be somebody else just by putting them in the shoes of somebody else. But, um, but I think that there are some really interesting ways of being able to create new perspectives, um, which I'll talk about uh, more in a bit as well. And then finally, I think, you know, through being able to use these, these sort of systems that are able to gather a lot of very uh, intimate data, which uh, I think brings its own sort of ethical, moral questions as well. But it can be used in things like diagnostics uh, and, and, and data and metrics as well. Um, Skip Rizzo, based at USC, then he's done some really um, fascinating work specifically on how VR can be used to diagnose people with ADHD. And I think that as we perhaps create uh, more of these sort of brain computer in, uh, interfaces and integrate biofeedback bio more, then, uh, then we're going to see even more um, sort of exciting research coming out of this. But going back a little bit to uh, the Big Anxiety Festival, then, um, then I guess I'm going to share a little bit now about my own journey into developing Hatsumi and, and some of the work that, that I've been doing since um, being part of this festival back in 2017. Um, and so during this festival, then um, I met a really fascinating researcher called Dr. Catherine Boydell, uh, and she introduced me to this fascinating arts and health research method called body mapping. So body mapping is an existing um, arts and health research method that was created during the 80s uh, in South Africa as a way of uh, inviting uh, women to uh, visualize what their experience of living with HIV and AIDS was. Um, it was quite a taboo subject. And I think that there was uh, an apprehension to, to talk about it. And so they started to create this method where traditionally what you do is you would trace around your body on a large piece of paper. You go through a mindfulness uh, 
plant-based experience and you think what is it like what does it physically feel like to live with HIV what sort of emotions or sensations do I feel in my body and, and really thinking about both the emotional and physical um, uh, experience of that and through this creative and reflective process you end up illustrating that uh, onto a large piece of paper and using that as a tool to essentially talk about um, your lived experience and since then it's been applied across a variety of um of different uh sort of phenomenological experiences uh so this is a piece of research that um that catherine did a few years back specifically of young people with uh the experience of first-time psychosis uh and with this as well they were looking at how you can not only illustrate what that experience is like but also talk about the coping mechanisms um as well and i became really fascinated with this um as an art form because again it sort of brings me back to this initial question that I was asking about how technology can help you understand somebody else and what happens when perhaps words aren't enough and we don't have the ability sometimes to articulate what we're feeling uh, as well as uh, being able to I guess um, articulate a more holistic the more holistic experience sometimes we just talk about the physical sides of things and sometimes we just talk about the emotional sides of things but these are ultimately like very linked and this connection between the brain and the body um is is uh incredibly significant and and often i feel like with the medical model it, it splits these two up quite a lot so over the last few years i've been developing my own sort of research running workshops and events and thinking about you know how can we start to um integrate this with technology as well. Um, and so we, I ran a series of workshops. This was actually back at Fabrica, the place where um, that I, I used to volunteer at and uh, started to work with people with lived experience, specifically of chronic pain, to uh, run these workshops and think about what would happen if we brought this into virtual reality and how would body mapping in a VR environment ultimately sort of change that experience um, and and with this I, I, and with this research, I think one of the things I have become incredibly fascinated by is how you know body mapping can be used across a variety of conditions, but but specifically looking at this question of chronic pain. Um, and chronic pain is something that 28 million adults in the UK are affected by, um, and so that's almost half the population. Um, and that we have this very limited time, amount of time to express what that experience of, of pain is like or any sort of condition um, within a medical context. But I think we've been really looking at our, asking this question specifically because I think it's a really interesting example of this connection between the brain and the body uh, and that, that, that physical pain and emotional pain are kind of experienced together as well. Uh, and, and with that as well, then then looking at how pain is currently measured as well and the fact that it is something that is incredibly difficult to measure so uh, at the moment then uh, the the way that pain is assessed has been largely unchanged since the 70s uh, so this is something called the mcgill uh, pain short form where basically you're invited to uh, put a cross onto a body onto your body onto this sort of alien like figure i guess uh, and then there's a series of words alongside and you have to number from one to ten uh, how much pain you feel like and these sort of very standard standardized quantitative measures really don't actually take account of you know all of the different um uh, sort of you know things that's happening in someone's life that could ultimately be affecting their experience of pain uh, and so and so we've been looking at answering this question of how can body mapping be um, applied to understanding uh, the experience of chronic pain. And, uh, and this is a sort of uh, early, early prototype that we created. Um, so initially this question, it was going to be my PhD that I was going to do at the University of New South Wales. Um, and I didn't get onto it after all. Uh, I then did some research over at Stanford University in the US and, and was uh, looking to do a, a PhD there. And again, sort of didn't get onto it. And so it was in, in the end, I moved back to the UK back in 2018 and was just like, right, well, I really want this to have a sort of scientific underpinning, but I want this to be uh, an artistic project as well. And I want to be able to bring it to as many people as possible. And, uh, and so we ended up, I, I, I found uh, an incredible developer called uh, Nico Smith 
and I've been working with him to develop this, this sort of initial prototype that, that we just sort of bootstrapped and, and did within our own time together. And so to this idea of how can we create a, a body in 3D uh, that you can illustrate both like on the skin, uh, inside the body uh, and outside the body and start to create a series of different drawing tools where um, they could sort of illustrate how they were feeling onto it. So this was our sort of like first attempt at, uh, at creating something. Um, and we tested it with a variety of different people as well. And I was very conscious that I'm not a medical professional. I'm not doing this in a sort of academic environment where there is an ethics committee. I became quite conscious of, of what sort of experiences I, I, I was asking people to illustrate if there were people that wanted to try it out, knowing ultimately that the question was about pain. Um, but within this research then, um, or, or being able to demonstrate it to people, then I asked a lot of questions actually. And so, um, so here are some of the sort of early users, I guess, and, and, and some of the experiences they um, illustrated. So um, for example, in the bottom right, that is a sound designer that was talking about the experience of making music and this idea that sometimes, you know, when you're in that creative process, you have an idea, you kind of try it out, you send it out to the world, you get that feedback and you sort of reiterate. Uh, and I thought that was so fascinating. Uh, sort of how people were starting to draw outside of their body um, and, and that connection between between their sort of internal bodies and the outside world and that perhaps we our feelings don't just stop at our skin. Um, and then in the bottom left as well, this is a, an illustration of someone um, uh, drawing the moment they told their partner that they loved them for the first time as well. And, uh, and they explained afterwards that their cheeks were really red because they were just really embarrassed and scared to be rejected. They had these sort of butterflies in their stomach, but those sort of red lines coming out, I think he, he actually asked for us to make brushes that were bigger because he wanted to describe this idea that your chest is almost expanding out from you in, in some way, um, um, which I thought was, was um, really, really lovely. Uh, and then also we had people that were drawing a variety of experiences um, that they, they had had as well. So this is actually somebody with um, quite severe body dysmorphia. Um, I've known her since we were about three years old. She's actually one of my closest friends. And, and, uh, and I was like, hey, I'm building this VR thing. Do you want to come try it out? And I was like, well, I'm not a psychologist, so let's do something like nice and positive. Would you like to talk about a nice experience that's happened to you recently? And uh, and she drew this illustration on the left, and this was um, a sort of yeah good moment that she had recently. Um, and we talked about it afterwards, and 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 um, and she sort of explained it to me. But then she was like, I actually would really like to draw draw my experience of body dysmorphia. And so she created this illustration on the on the right afterwards. And, uh, and I think it's really interesting seeing them side by side and the fact that her, her illustration of joy is not embodied, it's not inside her at all. It seems something that's like completely external to her. And, um, and, the, and then with her body dysmorphia, it's something that is completely internalized as well. And, uh, and so this started this like, you know, additional question of, well, these are these almost like internal maps that we, we're creating of how we, um, of how we do perceive ourselves and how we do perceive all these different types of experiences and how can we start to uh, remap them and remodel them and how do we take those experiences of joy and put them actually inside ourselves and think about how we can start to change uh, these kind of maps that we have about quite negative experiences as well. And how can we potentially start to digitize these experiences as well uh, and, and hold on to them and, and archive them and create uh, almost like a library of our own sort of different emotions and, and forms of lived experience as well and perhaps it, like look at how they do change over time. Um, so, so I became really fascinated with that and then I really want to kind of push on with, with, with trying this out in, in different settings as well uh, and, and, and being able to work with clinicians and, and, um, and patients to really refine like what is this question, how does it work, what kind of um, uh, environment could this exist in because I was still just doing this all very much independently and trying to find a home for uh, this research as well. And so I ended up doing some work with um, um, 
Guernsey Hospital, the Princess Royal um, over in Guernsey. And it was here that we, we tried it out with a chronic pain patient. So this was the first time I'd actually really tried it out with someone with um, experience of chronic pain. Um, and this gentleman then, he has a, a very severe form of chronic pain, which means that usually he can't stand up without something um, to support him unless he's, he's physically holding onto his, um, his left hand side, uh, unless he's in VR. And he tried out VR with um, the physiotherapist the week before and he was playing games like Beat Saber, which is kind of like a dance game if anyone's come across that. And to, in VR, because it's such a, an incredible pain management tool, um, then, then he just didn't feel it within the experience. But, um, but it was through him sort of creating this, this illustration here that he, um, he ended up actually having a very different conversation with his um, pain consultant nurse. And he started to draw, even though she'd been seeing him for four years, he started to um, describe what, what his illustration that he created here was. And the purple bits were actually sort of wiggling and moving around. And he started to distinguish between these more sort of consistent forms of pain and, and, uh, and these sort of like tickling forms of pain as well. And she was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. I can, like that's that's very much in line with this condition that he has. But then he started to draw this kind of like the, the tickling in his head as well. And he was saying, you know, this is this is how it affects me emotionally as well. And it has a huge impact on my life. And that that started a very different conversation about the emotional impact. And he ended up getting a new referral um, to uh, to see a, a psychologist that um, that could support him with that as well. I was really surprised when the nurse did say that she felt like if she could show that to another clinician, um, they'd also be able to potentially say what, what that condition was, uh, which was incredibly exciting, but also quite frightening as well, because I guess this sort of, you know, creative art project that I thought might help in healthcare was, was kind of being suggested that it could be used in, in diagnostics, which was not what I was uh, imagining at all. I saw this more as a sort of communication tool. Um, but it was around that time that I was just like, okay, well, how do I digitize this experience? How do we start to, when I say digitize, I mean, start to like archive this. How can we start to apply analytics to this as well? And, and what would some sort of infrastructure for this program be like? Um, and at the time I was working um, at um, the Fusebox, which is a VR co-working space here in Brighton. And it was there that I met someone called Ed Silverton, who's a really incredible um, sort of uh, technologist and, and designer um, and that has done a lot of interesting work in sort of open source frameworks. And he was working on this project um, called Morphosource, which is um, a sort of data archive that allows people, researchers to store, organize, share, and distribute their own 3D biological medical data. And so we were just having a cup of tea in the kitchen one day, and I was like, hey, I've been doing this thing. I've been trying out this prototype. People are like kind of an essentially annotating onto a 3D object where they're feeling pain and emotion. And I want to find a way of being able to like store these and analyze them, and bring it to hospitals. And he was like, well, that's kind of interesting because in some ways I'm sort of doing the same thing, which is annotating onto, you know, 3D data and finding ways to be able to archive them as well. And so we were like, this is kind of interesting. I wonder if there's like a way that we could work together on this. And, uh, and so we decided to do like a little um, hack day together. And I was like, can we try and see if we could make Morphosource a VR experience? Uh, and so that's what we did. And so this was about a year ago now. And so we kind of started with um, this program. He had a, a series of different uh, sort of 3D objects that he'd um, developed for an art gallery, but we put the, the sort of basic um, 3D model of the body in and we just like tried to hack it together and see if it would work. So this was the sort of really early origins uh, of the project and just being able to put some nodes onto the body because it was the software that he'd been developing before then having specific measurements uh, was really important um, or, or that's sort of what he created before. But this was sort of the beginning of uh, thinking about how we could actually make this something um, a bit bigger. Uh, and then I decided to apply for some funding. So I actually applied to uh, for, for Ed and I to work together, redevelop this, uh, and, and we got into a program called Creative XR, which started earlier this year. So this is a project that um, is um, an initiative that's supported by uh, Digital Catapult and Arts Out. 
Council England, uh, kind of for immersive art-based projects. So we kind of wandered in uh, as like a sort of Trojan horse of saying, hey, we're talking about art and, and sort of 3D visualization of experience. But yeah, we're kind of this Trojan horse where we're actually thinking about how we can, can bring it to um, healthcare. And with that, we were like, okay, let's bring together like a very multidisciplinary team. So we brought Ed on board. Uh, we also brought in uh, Dr. Esther Flanagan, who's a clinical psychologist to really support on the scientific side of things. Uh, we also brought in this amazing artist um, called Dave Sapien, who is uh, specializes in, in developing 3D brushes, but also lives with chronic pain as well, and which was incredibly uh, valuable in, in that sort of design and development process. Um, we also met someone um, called uh, Simon Holcomb, who is a sound designer that's done some really interesting work around cross-sensory experience and being able to uh, create sounds that are associated with colors. And we were thinking about, okay, if we, we redevelop this palette as well, could you paint with sound as well? And again, like looking at this idea around like potential diagnostics as well, and how can we observe trends perhaps in how people are visualizing their experience as well. And so Essin um, is also a um, resident at the Fusebox as well, that she's a, a computational neuroscientist that does some really incredible research in, um, in sort of, yeah, visuals and AI as well. And so she came on board to start to um, look into that as well. And then Kavita that has been really supporting with, with the sort of business strategy side of things as well and thinking about like, where would this go to and who would actually use this as well. And so we redesigned this uh, this uh, sort of UI. So we created a series of different brushes. Uh, we ran more workshops with people with lived experience of chronic pain. Uh, and this is just some of the stuff that, that that's sort of being created out of it. So now, instead of it being developed on, on Unity, then it's available on the web, uh, which means that if you have the access to the website and the password, then you can go on and you can use things like an Oculus Quest uh, and start to create your own illustrations. Um, let's see if I can show this other one as well. Um, and I think, you know, working with web VR, then it's, uh, you know, it's very different in terms of sort of the visual quality, perhaps, but I think in terms of making this as accessible as possible, and bringing it ultimately to, to people that need it the most, uh, and using it on headsets as well, that, uh, that are incredibly common, things like the Oculus Quest, uh, and Oculus are not particularly forthcoming with, with, with distributing VR healthcare uh, products, because I guess that kind of turns them into a, a medical device uh, and having to jump through those hoops of how it would be published on a store then this, this kind of creates a yeah an ability to um, make it far more accessible uh, here's some last images as well so we've sort of really redesigned these different drawing tools to create both static and 3d brushes um, things like electricity was requested quite a lot and we're thinking about ways that, for example, people could turn up or down the intensity. Um, people can also create them in different colours as well. So you could have like, you know, pink or green or black electricity. Um, things like bugs were requested quite a lot. And I think it's been interesting that process of working out how literal or abstract um, these sort of uh, drawing tools can and should be. And we ultimately want to be able to like sort of diversify the avatar more in the future as well and get people to uh, have find bodies that are perhaps more more um, reflective of, of their own and also change their positions um, as well. And so, yeah, this has been like a really interesting journey from like something that was meant to be a small art project to something that I guess is, can be applied to all these different things. And we're starting to think about, well, how can this start to be used uh, sort of more formally in a healthcare environment? And so by translating this, we, we are really extending the potential and thinking about, you know, can patients do this in the waiting room and take it into a, a sort of consultant's office? And how can it change that sort of doctor-patient communication when you're showing them rather than telling them something? and using it at home to be able to track their symptoms um, over time as well. And again, through research as well, how can we kind of integrate these ideas of like more qualitative approaches of using the arts in, in technology to express experience, but also start to integrate things like AI and machine learning to develop um, sort of new insights as well. And that's what Essen was doing with us um, during this sort of prototype redevelopment. And we've created this sort of neural network that's showing this, this ability to uh, start to predict what sort of conditions people might be able, might have um, 
through, through their illustrations that they're creating in, in the programme as well. And what we really want to do is see, like, can we can we kind of find this sort of halfway between, you know, more qualitative storytelling and more quantitative and, and showing and telling and the fact that, you know, you don't really get a true insight into someone's experience through these standardized pain and mental health surveys of, you know, how much pain you in from from one to 10. Uh, and on the other side, these sort of paper based body mapping methods as well that like require a lot of paper and space and time and can be frustrating as well if you don't necessarily have the artistic uh, skills to express those experiences and I know that was my frustration with um, paper body mapping to begin with that as much as I have worked in the arts I didn't see myself as an artist but there's something incredibly empowering when you have this palette of different tools and you can paint with electricity and fire and water and how expressive that can be um, for a user as well and making it very easy and intuitive for them to use. And then finally, these are artworks that people are creating, right? Like these are really cool opportunities to um, sort of engage the public in new conversations about um, health and well-being as well. Uh, and what I'm really looking forward to doing now as part of um, this sort of Creative XR program where we have been redeveloping it is partnering with galleries and museums to create both like digital online exhibitions as well as ones in physical spaces where we can bring all of these different illustrations together and almost create a sort of terracotta army um, of, of living experience and start new conversations about the fact that pain and emotion is uh, something we all experience especially this year and it ultimately does affect us in, in a variety of, of ways as well. Um, I'm conscious that we are um, running a little bit um, out of time, we've got 20 minutes for Q&A um, but uh, just thought I'd share a couple more um, drawings that people have created in here as well. I always do think oh, I've got so much time, 40 minutes is loads, I'll just squeeze in a bunch of other things as well uh, and uh, then forget how long I, I ramble on for. Um, but yeah, it's been really exciting that actually after being rejected from multiple universities and find, finding a place anywhere, that this is actually starting to get recognition from a variety of different places as well. And being like, well, maybe this is like a health tech project that can be taken to CAN and it can be recognized as, as a sort of, um, you know, piece of tech for good. And that it, yeah, we got some recognition from Google as well, which was really cool. And, uh, and we've actually contributed a chapter to a book in uh, applying body map mapping in, in research as well, which is coming out towards the end of this month. And uh, a variety of different researchers and academics from around the world have contributed towards this. And so I've contributed the chapter on virtual reality, which is rather exciting. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I think you know there is this, this opportunity for for more sort of cross interdisciplinary uh, working, and you can bring it to a variety of places as well. Um, I wanted to just give like a very small mention about Deep as well, which is the other project uh, that I work on that is uh, very much a sort of art science collaboration as well. So Deep is a meditative uh, VR experience controlled by breathing. Uh, and uh, and I've been really uh, enjoying working with the team on this the last few years as well. And I think in some ways they're so much further than than, than myself and what I've been doing with um, with Hatsumi, because they've actually been able to collaborate with uh, researchers in a way that to create a sort of ongoing uh, connection and collaboration. So we've been working with the the Games for Emotional Mental Health Lab over at Radboud University in the Netherlands, and published a series of papers that have really sort of demonstrated the efficacy of this experience. Uh, and helped uh, in people to helping people to manage their anxiety, but also reduce disruptive classroom behaviour with children with complex needs as well. And again, like it's something that has uh, had papers published in it, but it's also been taken to film festivals and been written about in a variety of places. And, and I really see that as like the opportunity for this kind of technology that it has the opportunity to meaningfully help people and actually by making it fun and playful and engaging, uh, then it can kind of bring it further as well. 
Um, and then finally, a very, very brief mention as well about the work that um, I have been doing uh, with Immerse UK the last few years is thinking about how do we start to dissolve these boundaries between different industries? How do we get academics and researchers talking to artists and doctors and patients uh, and starting to create a sort of new way of, of working that's a bit more collaborative? And so alongside the different uh, conferences and events we've been running, we've done what, uh, we've moved all of them online during COVID and covered anything from femtech to art therapy to grief and end of life and pediatrics and um and uh and and, and creating um uh, reports as well and what the, the opportunities are for bringing together artists and scientists in this space as well and so i do think we really need to stop thinking that you know you have to be an artist or a researcher or a startup but actually like all of these things are starting to blend um, into one another and I think for really compelling experiences you need to have representation from all of those different industries and we do need to think about how we work together to create this 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 ecosystem as well and uh, it's exciting to see that you know these are just some of the organizations that, that really recognize the the potential of uh, immersive technologies in, in health and well-being and uh, and so I think I'll probably leave it there but I think that you know we're getting closer to a point where perhaps virtual reality could be prescribed and um, and there are some really interesting um, opportunities and also challenges that we still need to overcome as well. So um, I will leave it there. But thank you ever so much for listening to this rather long and rambly talk. But, uh, but hopefully I get some insight into some of the exciting opportunities here. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk, Sarah. Um, so we have a bit of time for some questions, um, and I guess I can start um, with like the, the thing that really struck me is that there is like uh, clearly like a great potential for enhancing healthcare and um, tailoring healthcare to um, individual patients, um, but uh, there's obviously many challenges that that are going to be faced. Um, in introducing something like immersive technology uh, within the healthcare system. Uh, so in, in your opinion, what do you think are the main challenges in getting, in getting immersive technology um, in the healthcare system as, as sort of a, uh, prescribed to patients? Absolutely. Well, I guess that's why I conveniently left this slide open here. But I think that, you know, we have such a unique opportunity here in the UK that we do have something like the, the National Health Service and that we do have a, a more sort of connected infrastructure. But I think even imagining how do we start to distribute these experiences, right? And how do we start to get this, this meaningful adoption? You know, if there's things like STEAM for distributing games, like why is there not a STEAM for healthcare? And, uh, and how would we even go about creating that how do you start to create these sort of standards uh, and think about how you create that evidence base behind it um, and I guess like all these sort of bullet points um, sort of summarize so, so some of those other challenges as well I think the fact that lots of people from you know the games industry don't like think like oh or, or say you know I never even knew that that VR could be used in healthcare I thought it was just entertainment and so I think being able to um to go to games conferences and, and say like look like this is all the ways that it can be um supported but also going to healthcare conferences and saying like hey this is how it can be used as well and finding ways to get people from these different industries talking uh and finding a way to really support um you know sort of larger organizations that have already demonstrated that they can develop really powerful experiences. So for example, Game Change by um, Oxford VR, that's um, a huge project that's been developed to support people uh, living with psychosis um, to sort of overcome some of their challenges and enable them to sort of um, connect with society again. Like they, those projects are amazing. They've had such a huge amount of success, but they're also sort of born out of academia and had quite a lot of uh, investment. But what happens to the sort of smaller organizations or independent artists that are interested in this? And like, how do you connect them with, with researchers as well? So I think there needs to be more opportunities to um, enable uh, sort of collaboration and start to invest in, in, the, in the makers behind it as well. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from Discord, um, and the, the person has asked, um, have you worked in phobia therapy using VRAR, and how far do you think 
um, I guess immersive technology in healthcare can go uh, only with visual stimulus. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting research that has been happening around phobias. So, um, so Daniel Freeman at Oxford then, um, so I think one of his initial pieces of research was around fear of heights. And he found that VR was um, able to reduce people's uh, fear of fear of heights by about 68% which is quite incredible. Um, and so, yeah, projects like Game Change, I think are very much related to phobias as well. They've created a series of environments for places that, that people would find quite um, challenging to go to and enable them to uh, access them in a quite um, safe environment. But with Explore Deep, that's also something that we're looking at more and more at the moment as well. We started to collaborate with um, the Brave Center, which uh, is a PTSD research center in the US. And we're creating a series of exposure environments uh, that can sort of recreate those sort of sense of fear. But also through uh, not just using visuals, but I think sound is incredibly important as well. Um, you know, when you think about like watching a, a film without sound, how much it, it kind of removes that experience. But that, that is where the emotion is. And, uh, and integrating things like biofeedback as, as well, I think, can really sort of uh, take an experience to, to the next level if it's, it, if it's relevant to what you're exploring. And so with Deep, then we've created this exposure environment, but then through integrating the sort of biofeedback of the breath that they can start to self-regulate and see their breath visualized in front of them and create these new strategies for managing um, challenging experiences is, mm. is really valuable. Well, um, I guess bio, biofeedback, uh, like we just mentioned, leads nicely into this kind of the next um, question. Um, so you, you mentioned in your talk about um, things like Oculus and uh, I guess when, when these devices start being used for medical purposes, it will become a medical device and I guess could be subject to another set of rules or regulation. Um, but I, I'd be interested to hear um, what what do you think are the limitations of um, the VR hardware that's out there on the market at the minute? And I guess what do you think could be added to them uh, in terms of different kinds of sensors uh, that that would help developers create immersive technology for healthcare? For example, perhaps putting something like a heart rate sensor into the headset. I don't know how it, I don't know how it would be done, but uh, you know. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, lots of thoughts on it. Well, yeah, I think it's it's a really interesting moment for all of this because I guess, you know, the, the people that seem to be really dominating the VR market at the moment are people like Oculus that have quite a challenging history when it comes to sort of, you know, ethical, moral dilemmas that they're raising around, you know, data security and that's just with well that's not that, that, that that's with you know connecting it to people's facebook accounts so what happens once we start integrating very personal medical information as well and do we want to trust them with that um and and they are definitely very interested in in um sort of brain, brain computer in, interfaces and have started to acquire companies to um to you know think about how to integrate biofeedback as well and i think that ultimately we do need to create standards and we do need to regulate this to a point that we can keep people safe and protect the data that is um collected um the xr safety initiative have a, a medical xr council which i'm a part of and i think you know through gathering people that are interested and excited in the space that are working across medical and gaming to start to think about how we create this is um incredibly important and and needs to happen sooner rather than later because um, I think that the longer we leave it the more there is to untangle um, but there are lots of very uh, interesting and exciting companies that are thinking about how to integrate bio sensors um, in, in, in much easier ways because with um, with with deep then then I think that that Owen Harris who's the, the, the sort of founder of deep and been working with Nikki Smith for years then he was looking at you know what sort of uh, biosensors are there available in the market and was just like it's actually just easier to make something myself and so he created this sort of like Arduino belt that you wear around your diaphragm but now there are sort of much more compelling opportunities to um, find technologies that do integrate it so for example mtech uh, are a company that also based here in brighton that have made a sort of fully um bi full biofeedback integrated vr headsets they've been working with pico uh it's got everything from heart rate sensors to photoplasmography that's 
helping also detect your heart rate, but um, it's, it can detect breathing, galvanic skin response. And so it's fully, fully incorporated into it. And there are a number of um, other researchers, people like Adam Gasly as well um, from uh, UCFF, UCSF. UCSF uh, over in San Francisco as well as doing some really um, interesting research into sort of different forms of, of closed loop technologies. But I think there's also scope to just include things that we use every day from, from Apple watches to, to Fitbits as well um, and really sort of recognize what is, what is data that is genuinely valuable and not just like integrating it for the sake of it, but actually how you can pay create a, a sort of valuable experience for someone. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point, I guess. Um... The, the, all of these smartwatches uh, are starting to really focus on on healthcare as well. So I guess the, creating a link between the the, the smartwatches and and the headsets um, could be a an easy win uh, in in this space. Um, so I guess the the final question that um, I have is around the body mapping um, work which you showed, uh, and uh, one of the things that I noticed is that. I guess what you have is quite artistic and, and um, I guess, simple representations of the human body. Um, and I guess the, the, the question is, uh, do you, what, what do you think using more personalised human models of the patient or the, or the subject would do? Do you think this is a, a, a great way to enhance it? Um, and I guess that the, there's also the opportunity that it can lead to other works you mentioned. Um, I guess it's your your friend that has uh, body dysmorphia. Um, mm -hmm. I guess there, there's I guess lots of um, uh, studies that could be done around the way we see ourselves versus how we actually are, and VR could be a great a great interface for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think, you know, we did do some early tests beforehand about what happens if we actually could put in a 3D scan of ourselves. And so so I did manage to put in, in fact, a 3D scan of myself into there and, and got to body map onto my own body. And actually, it was very unpleasant and did not work with the experience at all, because suddenly you're far more distracted with what you look like. And actually, you know, day to day, when I'm not thinking about, you know, the, the length of my hair, I, I can just feel the body that I'm in. So so I think it's important that that the the avatar that you are um, uh, illustrating on is 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 more representative of you, and that's something that we really want to improve on as as we keep on developing it. But actually, I think there's a point where you know it starts to hit that uncanny valley, or just does look like you, and 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 then you're just more distracted by that than thinking about you know what is my experience of anxiety like what is my experience of pain like and that this is just like a canvas that I, I I'm relating to because of the way that the experience has been built but isn't actually um distracting but um but yeah I I really am enthusiastic about applying this to a diversity of of conditions and and um and sort of phenomenological experiences and so we've started with chronic pain because like I had no idea how huge it was the fact that you know 50% of, of people like listening to this talk like live with some form of chronic pain like that is huge and the fact that a lot of forms of chronic pain like you know can be caused by um physical uh sort of you know uh, accidents or things that may have happened but also a result of anxiety and, and and traumatic experiences then i think you know that's why we really want to explore that now but um absolutely there's so much more that i want to apply it to like if anyone is interested in in applying it to their research like please get in touch i'd be really really interested in in seeing its applications go further beyond but i think yeah in terms of um uh, sort of uh, eating disorders, things like body dysmorphic disorder. I think, you know, there are some really interesting applications there looking at depression, anxiety, but I'm also really interested in the positive stuff as well. You know, like what does a thousand people saying they love you to somebody for the first time, what does that look like? And how can we start to use this as a form of uh, cross-cultural research as well? And that's something that I'm really interested in as well. Like, do people draw their experience of pain the same around the world? And how do um, our sort of different relationships with, with colour and the way that we talk about the body globally uh, sort of change the way that we might uh, uh, sort of illustrate those experiences? And what can we actually learn about just the human experience and the diversity of human experience in the body? as well yeah I, I agree there's there's uh there's lots of opportunity in it and uh uh yeah it's uh 
it really is a really interesting line of work that you're in. Um, so I think this is a good point now to um, close the session. So on behalf of everyone at the conference, I would like to thank you for your talk, Sarah. Um, I wish we had uh, a way of you hearing the applause. Uh, we should have got a, a, an, an audience soundboard or something. Um, but yeah, so thank you very much for your talk. Um, so up next, we have a networking lunch from 12 until 1. So uh, please grab a bite to eat and use the spaces on Discord to network um, exactly as you would have done if we were at the BFI. Um, and we hope that you're able to see familiar faces in the corridor, the blue room and the theatre. Um, following on from the networking lunch from 1 until 2, we have themed networking sessions. Um, and I encourage you all to join that. And with that, I think we're now in a place to end the session. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot.